outside of somebody hitting your wall or something, I'm sure we'll be fine. Welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off Road Podcast. I'm Big Z, and I'm joined today remotely uh, from the Southern United States uh, with Marcelo uh, Danzi from Assault Industries. How you doing, bud? Doing great. Doing great. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, I always enjoy having uh, company CEOs or founders or um, manufacturing uh, partners or people like that on the show because it's always an interesting conversation. Um, and I'm excited to, to get into your guys' history and where you're going and some big news that recently came up. Um, but uh, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself. Let us all know who, who you are, the face behind assault industries that people don't necessarily know when they see ads on Instagram or something. But uh, yeah, give us your intro. Let us know who you are, where you're at, and what where the businesses is at located in, in the servicing uh, districts and all that. Yeah, awesome. Well, first of all, thanks for having me on. And I am a little bit nervous as I've never done a podcast before. But uh, uh, anyways, I'm Marcelo Danzi, um, founder of Assault Industries. And uh, we're here in Garden Grove, California. Um, and uh, basically, I've had... Uh, I started Assault back in 2013 and kind of uh, started getting into the UTV industry, which is my passion, something I love, love, love to do. Um, and we make parts for UTVs. And uh, right now, pretty much, we're more of a performance uh, race style parts for uh, the, the cars and all that, but really uh, looking into getting into overland and utility and all that. Yeah, so 2013, that was before, you know, the turbos came out that was before um even the big uh progression into the 1000s right that was like er fairly early on it wasn't the beginning but it was kind of in that midsection between um these utility vehicles turning into sport machines uh what was the industry like then and what what got you interested in, in getting into it well a crazy story the first uh the first utv i got into well it was the rhinos back in the day and a uh, little backstory on on me is I do, I've been machining and manufacturing for, uh, you know, Yamaha, Honda, Kawasaki, all the Harley Davidson um, for probably about 25 years. So I was making parts for them through my machine shop um, way, way back and still do till today. So, so actually uh, creating manufacturing parts for the OEs. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Contract manufacturing. Um, so we were working with Yamaha on the rhinos. We did everything from skid plates to, to, uh, I mean, <laughs> we made a lot of parts for the rhinos back then. Um, and they were working on some special stuff and, uh, probably what people don't know is they had a four seater before, uh, anybody knew. And, uh, unfortunately they dropped that whole project. Um, and we had to throw a lot, a lot of parts away, but, uh, it, it was kind of a bummer for, for me to see that because we were literally working with Yamaha from day one on that project. And then it went, went away and then uh, Polaris stepped in and got the, uh, the, what was, I believe it was a 800, the RZR 800. Yep. And that was my first time on the car in one of those UTVs. Um, my brother is Alex Danzi and he was the owner and founder of Pro Armor. So it's kind of a family thing. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. I mean, yeah, it's pretty crazy because both my brother and, and myself worked for my dad. My dad, uh, uh started, innovative metal design. And that's where myself and my brother really learned how to manufacture. So we really got to give uh, thanks to my, you know, my mom and dad for uh, the opportunity to work at the machine shop and, and learn everything about machining. And um, so how young were you when you first uh, started cutting metal and, and working in the shop? Oh, God, I, I mean, back in the day, my dad started in his garage in our garage. And we had a little engine lathe and, and uh, Bridgeport uh, mill. So I was there just pulling the handle, doing little chamfers and holes on all these parts. And um, so I started back in the day when I was like probably, you know, I don't even know, 13, 14 years old. Um, but I got really, really involved in the uh, CNC and manufacturing, probably like in my in my early 20s. Um, and that's where, you know, both my brother and I, we used to manufacture lots of parts for GT Bicycle was one of our biggest uh, customers and we did everything for those guys we helped them with pretty much every billet part that got either welded uh chain rings we did seat posts uh but yeah we were probably one of the biggest suppliers um so we really and this was right when cnc machines were coming out so 
Uh, we we grew really quick. Um, and then and to get into a CNC machine wasn't a small deal, right? Like back then, I mean, a lot of people right now, little small shops are starting to get CNC machines, right? Like it's a it's kind of like the new fad that you have a CNC machine. Um, but back then, that was not a small investment. No, no, it was yeah, it was scary, but we you know we uh, dove into it and. We started with one and then GT just goes, oh my God, we need, you know, you need to go buy two, three. And we kept growing. And at one time we had, and back then, this was back in the eighties, we had, oh, nine, 10 machines, which, you know, most machine shops back then, you know, barely had one. Uh, so it was, it, it was exciting. And, and, uh, you know, from GT bicycles, we got, um, unfortunately they went almost belly up, uh, bankrupt, that whole industry kind of changed. And that's when we start working with Yamaha. And that was a game changer for, for all of us. Um, and another, where was this manufacturing facility kind of located? Like you guys started in your shop, I'm assuming in, in California or where, what, where was that? And then where did you guys migrate to? Yeah. So we started in Huntington Beach. So I grew up in Huntington Beach. Uh, my dad's shop was on Gothard Street in Huntington <laughs> Beach. A uh, little tiny, God, it was like, I don't know, 3,000 square feet. And then we rented the unit next to us and then we rented the next unit. So <laughs> we continued to grow. Uh, unfortunately, Huntington got really, really expensive. And as we started to look for bigger buildings and, you know, we then moved to Westminster. So we pushed out a little bit and then we outgrew that building and then we ended up in Garden Grove. So, um, you know, a little bit of a, a little bit of, of a further drive to the beach, but uh, still pretty close. <laughs> That's a bummer uh, work perk, you know, just driving to the beach. <laughs> <laughs> well, I used to go to lunch every time, you know, I'd be at the pier or Main Street and it was great when we were in Huntington. It was, you know, a five minute drive. Just can't do those lunches anymore. So you guys went through the whole bicycle industry thing. You jumped on board with Yamaha. How how did that contract come around? I mean, like jumping in with a, with a, a global manufacturer, right? That's not a small uh, contract. That's a big deal. And and even in the 80s or 90s, like that's still a big deal for a company that literally makes everything. How does that how does that come about? So it was crazy because they came to us and said, hey, can you guys engineer? And it was me and my brother and my dad and, you know, a couple little uh, guys that help uh, operate the machines. And they're like, hey, we just want to give you, you know, one of our star bikes, some, you know, YXZ uh, dirt bikes. And then we've got this quad that we're coming out with. Um, it was the uh, GYTR, uh, what was it? The 680, I believe it was. And they basically, this was right when GYTR was becoming a brand. And so was the star line for their uh, cruisers. And back then they just gave us a bike and we went to town and we just, you know, start designing parts for them and making parts. They'd make the prints. Um, so we started from the very, very beginning with those guys and just, uh, you know, we made the best relationship. Uh, and I think I really, well, actually, I don't think I know that working with them for so many years, I worked with all their quality guys. I worked with purchasing, I worked with, uh, engineers. And I learned every aspect of the business and I learned how to manufacture and design to make a profitable part, but make it strong because of quality, it, you know, you got to have a really good quality system. So i just through all those, you know, learning all that stuff and putting it all together is how I kind of learned. And I think it's my brother as well. We both learned how to make uh, and manufacture really good, high quality parts that have prints behind them, have a quality system behind them. Um, so did you guys go to school for engineering or did you go to college to create a degree in manufacturing or anything like that? No, no, <laughs> neither my brother or I, I mean, you know, I always laugh because uh, I always tell everyone, oh yeah, I went to UBL and they're like, UBL, what, what college is that? I'm like, well, there's a, it's a community college, at, you know, uh, Golden West College, but it was right behind uh, Levitt's. So there used to be Levitt's, a big Levitt's furniture store. People probably don't even <laughs> know what it is, but I used to be, yeah, university behind Levitt's. <laughs> so that's where I went. Uh, and I was going for architecture. I wasn't even going for engineering. And um, I got my AA in architecture, but really decided that, uh, you know, we had, my dad gave me the opportunity and I uh, so, so glad that uh, I went. This <laughs> so, so did dad ever go to college for engineering? Was that part of his education system as well? 
Oh yeah. Yeah. My dad. So my dad's from, originally from Uruguay um, with my mom. My grandparents are all Italian. So we've got a little bit of a South American and Italian in us. But my you got dad, all the best breeds in you, bud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah, in both of those countries are beautiful. I mean, if you ever have a chance to go visit, yeah, you know, it's a whole nother story or another podcast, but uh, my dad is a uh, tool of trade, a uh, tool and die by trade. And he went to, uh, he used to work for GT, uh, not GT, um, GE electric um, in Uruguay. And he's just, I mean, he used to make the dies for like, tool and dies for like all these different um products and back then you had to do it there was no cnc so everything was made on a mill or a lathe and i mean this the the talent he has and um what is amazing so um and the great thing about my dad is like he was the one that would say hey this is the way you need to hold the part in the machine and this is how you got to machine it so he really opened up my mind on how how to make parts on the cnc machines and how to design and how to hold and so yeah, it, it's, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. There's definitely a learning process involved with CNC, right? Like you would think that you just throw a block in it of some sort of material. The machine just does all the work and then it pops out free floating, like this thing that you can just pop on the car, right? There's a whole process between the different steps and how you hold it and how you anchor it and all that kind of stuff. It's a, it's a lot more work than people, you know, realize. Oh yeah. Yeah. And that's, in the, it's funny because, you know, sometimes I work with different companies and different engineers and you know, they're straight out of college and all that. And they're like, Hey, I want to make this part. And they design it really badass part. But then you're like, well, <laughs> you know, there's really no way to hold this part. There's no, you know, <laughs> this part's going to be like a thousand dollars by the time we're done with it. Are you sure you want it this way? But yeah, there is, it, there's definitely an art to, uh, to manufacturing. Do you guys find yourself in a position where there's something you want to make and you end up having to see and see your own part to make the part? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, there's been many, many times where, you know, we're just looking at, okay, how can we make this? And it has to do a lot with fixturing and, and, uh, you know, making tooling that you could hold that part to, uh, to really finish the part to, uh, to the print or the way the customer designs it. You guys got to a point where you started creating OEM parts and, and, and subcontracted engineering and things like that. Uh, what was the next step of that evolution? You, you were working for Yamaha. What was the next big bump in that growth curve? Um, I think, uh, you know what we get, we really got known in the industry and manufacturing as a one-stop shop and with innovative metals. I mean, we, you know, we started with Yamaha and then all of a sudden Honda's knocking on our doors and then Kawasaki, um, and meanwhile, funny how all the Asian partners that kind of like pseudo work together, start working together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the great thing is, is that working with them, you know, and just working with different nationalities and, you know, the Japanese, and I mean, they look at things and they, they, they're really big on ISO and quality. And I mean, uh, what is it, uh, 5S, um, I mean, all that good stuff. And it, so it really elevated our machine shop and they forced us to get ISO certified um, quality systems, you know, make sure our calipers and all our machines are up to date. So we are way, way above a lot of manufacturers out there. And, um, and you know, it forced me to really understand, Hey, when you make a part, it's gotta be to print and that print better have the right tolerances and you better have the right materials, which I learned a lot about <laughs> in welding. And I mean, so, so this is where it's great is that with, since we went and got ISO, uh, we all of a sudden now we're like, we're doing stuff for Boeing. We're doing right. SpaceX. We're doing parts for SpaceX. We're doing medical. I mean, all of a sudden everybody start knocking on our door and, um, it got really, re I mean, it, it was really fun. I mean, I loved working for Yamaha and Honda and we still, like I said, we still do, um, those guys, it's, it's great to make a product and then be out in the desert and go, Oh, that's my, uh, that's my, <laughs> right. our Nerf bars that we made. And, uh, you know, um, and, and great teams, but then working with the aerospace and the medical, it just got really, really difficult. And, and I mean, difficult by you're, you're making parts that go on a plane that fly, you know, hundreds of people or thousands of people a year. And, and now you're at night going, Oh my God, you know, you're relying on your quality system, your employees and, and 
it just got a little bit stressful. Um, and for those uh, that don't know what ISO is, can you kind of just give like a one or two sentence liner of like introduction of what that actually means and what it means for your business and as far as liability requirements and all that? Yeah. So ISO certifications, um, I mean, you, it, it's a certification. It's not like you pay for this uh, cert and your ISO. I mean, there's a full process of, you know, your everything from making sure all your tools that you use for measuring are, uh, you know, uh, uh, God, what is it called? Um, they all have to be certified and, and validated and all also, that. Yeah. Yeah. Everything needs to be certified. There's a process for everything from contract reviews to um, if you have a part that doesn't meet the uh, print requirements, then you have to have everything. Um, rejections have to have like e explanations and there's so much documentation that needs to be done that it almost, you almost need a, a team um, to uh, handle that, that, that uh, certification. So it's a lot, a lot of work. It's a lot of money. Um, but it does make sure that every I is dotted, every T is crossed, um, every part that leaves your, your, your machine shop, it meets the print requirements and it's, it's made exactly to, uh, what the customer wants. Um, and that's a, that's a big step for a company. That's not a small, just like I was saying about CNC, it's a big investment, like you said, with resources, time, money, all that stuff. But it also is a big long-term, a long tail reliability because now you have to cover all those bases. You can't just like step back and say, oh, we're not going to do that anymore. You, you now have to follow through with that long-term. Oh yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's not something you do overnight. I mean, it's probably a good year process. Um, and just keeping it up is, is another, just like I said, you need a team to do it. It's a lot of work. Um, but at the end of the day, it makes your company more valuable. Um, and you know, our rejection rate for, um, all my customers is like point, you know, 0.05%. I mean, we have very, very, very little, re uh, rejections and then our time delivery, you know, everything gets measured. Um, so, you know, we can't, we, everything has to be on time. We can't have rejections. And if you do, then you lose your certification, um, or you lose your customer first and then you start losing your certification because you're obviously not following the process of, uh, the ISO. So at some point you, you have this harebrained idea to start a salt industries. Um, you know, where did the name come from? The logo come from, I have a feeling of where the logo came from, but you, you tell me how, how did the name come about? How did the brand start and, and how did that take off from where you were in the manufacturing side? So, you know, at one point my brother left and did uh, pro armor. So it left me and my dad, um, you know, taking over innovative metals. And, uh, you know, we still worked for OEMs. My brother did his own brand, um, Pro Armor. And, you know, I just kept seeing him going, you know, uh, to all these events. I see him out riding. And, <laughs> a little and, sib uh, sibling jealousy going on. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, I was I was really jealous. I mean, it, it his 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 business looked like a lot of fun. Um, and uh, it was crazy because, you know, Innovative Metals was doing great. But owning a machine shop is a lot of work. It's, there's so much competition, um, and um, and then you know, knowing that my brother, we're finding out that you know uh, he was selling the company. Uh, that's when I said, hey, I didn't want to ever compete against them, and I said, you know what, this is my opportunity. I go, I'm gonna, you know what, I've got my uh, XP 900 at the time, which was my first UTV Polaris XP 900, which was. A really badass machine. Love that thing. Um, I said, you know what? I'm going to start making my own parts. And and I just started looking at the machine and going, okay, God, what's what's it need? I'm like, the first thing it needed was mirrors. I was like, <laughs> I've got to make some mirrors for this thing. Um, and uh, and then radius rods and tie rods. And so, anyways, I I'm like, you know what? I'm going to make some products and then um, I'm going to figure out a name and start building this brand. Um, on the side. And that's when, uh, you know, the name, the name was crazy because, you know, I would, every time I'd get together with friends and family, I would just throw names out. I mean, I, it took me probably a good three to six months to figure out the right name for this company. Um, and I wanted something really aggressive and the assault just, you <laughs> assault's know, pretty aggressive. So, <laughs> yeah. So, but this is, this is what happened was when I, I finally got it, I registered it and, you know, I'm like, okay, assault industries, this is perfect. 
right after I, I uh, filed for the, uh, the name, the company and the corporation and all that, um, all the uh, shootings, uh, Sandy Hook started. Oh no. Yeah. So I'm here, I am going, I really, really screwed up with the name, you know, oh, assault rifle, uh, you know, everybody, you know, all these attacks are happening. I'm like, oh, I really screwed this one up. Um, but, uh, right when, uh, so I, this was back right before sand sports show. And I can't remember the year, I think it was 2012 or it might be 2013. Um, you know, my brother and Fred from pro armor, they're like, Hey, why don't you put a little, uh, 10 by uh, 10 by 10 easy up and come check out and see if you could sell your products. So, you know, it was me, Manuel, uh, my QC manager, Ted at the time that worked for, uh, my machine shop and he'd actually helped me with uh with a qa for assault we went to the show and people just love the name i was like scared i was like oh god all right what are the people going to say but that first uh sandsport show people are like oh my god we love your look we love your name they love the logo everybody you know that that the a and i'll tell you the story behind that um everybody loved it so from there I say, hey, I think we're onto something. It's really aggressive, but this the industry, they love, you know, um, they they love the aggressiveness of our name, um, assault. So, and then, you know, my tagline, I was always thinking, I'm like, well, I gotta tell people what it really means because I don't want them to think that I'm assaulting people. So I came up with, hey, we're assaulting all terrains. Um, and what I mean by that is like, Hey, we can assault the dirt. We're assaulting the sand. We're assaulting snow. Eventually we should be assaulting water doing, you know, watercraft stuff and all that. Um, so that's where the name came from. That's kind of what it stands for is like, Hey, we are going to go, uh, just, you know, kick some ass and, and beat up any kind of terrain that comes in front of us. Um, so going back to the logo, uh, Obviously, it looks like a, an A. Um, it's I always called it a puzzle piece, and kind of what I uh, what uh, I envisioned when I made it. Except first, it was just an A, and it kind of turned into a diamond. I'm like, no, um, and it was kind of like, hey, we we manufacture, um, we engineer, and then the third one. God, this goes back so far. I mean, unfortunately, I think it like customer service or just making sure that you know. Um, I always looked at it as far as like it looked like you were folding apart, right? Like you were breaking the the sheet metal to be what you were making, and that's kind of where my thought was in, in in that logo. But it's interesting that it it was a puzzle piece because that's how you were thinking about the company. It was these multiple components coming together to be one thing. That's what, yeah, it was. And like I said, I, I apologize. I just, my memory is not as good as it used to be. And, I, and it had the, literally I had the words inside there and I'm like, no, no, I just want to simplify it, make it clean. And I got the, I got rid of the words and, um, but, and I just love the way, but it is, you're right. It's just parts coming together to make one, um, one solid logo there. So you're talking about, you know, one of your first things you made was mirrors. Was that the actual first to market product? And then how did the product line expand uh, from that point? You know, I never had, never had experience making mirrors, um, but I had the CNC machines. I was like, Hey, let's make a billet, um, a billet mirror. We'll just, you know, we'll figure out somewhere to go have someone cut some uh, mirror glass for us. We'll epoxy it in there. We had some good epoxies that we used with the Yamaha and, and other people um so i literally just sketched it on a piece of paper and i gave it to my uh uh oh, no i sent it over to manuel uh he's he, he knows cad really well and i said hey manuel let's let's figure out how to make this happen um and he drew it up and and literally gave me a solid work file and i gave it to my cnc guy and he basically machined it and it was pretty cool because it was just a really small you know it, the shape of it was really um unique it was actually just a rectangle but it had it had depth to it it has some military chevrons because that's we, we believe really heavily on our military here um and then like that's the first product one of the first products we took sandsport we sold it out of like i think we only made like i don't know 25 sets <laughs> but that was a lot at the time uh but we sold out of them and uh and then from there we it literally just start looking at the uh, xp 900 going okay what else can we make for this thing um, and then, you know, I bent one of my radius rods, unfortunately I hit a witch's eye out in Glamis and I said, okay, well, Hey, <laughs> this, this is, you know, what we need to do. And 
the funny thing with the radius rods back in the day, we made them out of aluminum and, you know, racers and sand cars and all that. Everybody used chromoly and it was all tubing. Right. Um, so the funny story is, is that, you know, everybody loved our design and, you know, it was anodized and they're like, oh, it's aluminum. It's super lightweight. Um, and I just remember being out at a race out, out in a, a state line. And there are some uh, other products out there that people are making and they're making them out of aluminum tubing thinking that ours were tubing. Uh, <laughs> and the first jump, they're like, you know, just bending and, you know, racers are all pissed off and they're like, Hey, you know, and people came to me and they're like, Hey, have you tested yours? And I'm like, Oh yeah. And I've got videos. I mean, the, I never released the product without testing it. So I've got a press break with a gauge showing how much pressure the old, the stock ones broke. And, you know, ours were like three times as strong, but they were solid aluminum, which no one was doing at the time. So, you know, it's kind of cool being the innovator of, uh, of aluminum uh, radius rods and, you know, people not knowing anything about aluminum. And now it's like, you know, every that's the standard, right? Everyone's. Right. Uh, um, so what I, think I, did, you, I think you said something that's important on on testing. It's not just testing like you bolted onto your car and it survived a trip, right? It's it's putting it through an abusive environment that is X number fold above where you expect that to fail, right? Where do you, how do you guys approach that? Like, do you have a number of like factor that you guys put into your product? Yeah, it's, you know, I'm always trying to make sure what we do is as strong or stronger than, um, than stock. Um, so, cause liability and the worst thing that you want to do is put out a product that all of a sudden isn't, you know, put it to the test and, and it fails on our customers. So, um, you know, I can't say that we're always perfect, but we always fix the issues. Um, but yeah, we do all kinds of, we try to do all kinds of testing here. Um, you know, if it's, if it's just putting it on a forklift and lifting it and dropping it, uh, you know, uh, you know, like a arms right now, we we've had a set of a arms for the can am out for over a year, giving them to a racer. And he's put three, probably about 3000 miles on them with no cracks, no issues. Um, so we're ready to come out with suspension parts. Um, and so that's, you know, a lot of times it's in house, um, but we do use, um, racers and, and our own cars that go out testing as well. So you, you moved away for, you, you didn't move away. You, you've added to your product line with, uh, beyond just accessories, you're now building cons- suspension components. You're starting to build different parts of the car that make the car itself stronger. Right. Um, and then you've expanded even further into things like harnesses and, and things like that. Um, now I don't believe you guys weave your own strap and do all that stuff in house, right? Like how do you approach sourcing and product development that then includes outside manufacturing? Yeah. So, um, like for seat, the harnesses, for instance, um, we'll send them to, uh, get tested for SFI. So they'll certify them for us and make sure that everything's good. That, that yeah, like you said, the, the, the uh, harnesses are safe and, and, um, to the standards. Um, and then anything else that, you know, if we do have someone else source something for us, we bring it in and then obviously do all the testing before we release it. Um, but what we do is we'll make, uh, you know, we send out products out to, methodologist to make sure the materials are good. Um, we, we have a QC department here that will look at the parts and make sure that they're print. Um, and then obviously we always make tool samples and prototypes before we go into production. Now you also, over the last few years have started incorporating other partner brands, right? Like you've brought on different things that you guys don't necessarily natively build in house, but that you build components for, like you make, you know, whip mounts and you, so you carry buggy whips, you make, um, various different products that complement partner products. Um, this industry is very much about, we've talked about it on the show multiple times about how important partnerships are and working with each other and, and helping each other out. And, you know, that's what kind of what our community is, right? We've talked about, you know, someone's busted down in the dunes, we go help them out. If they're broken down on the trail or falling off a hillside, we go help them out, things like that, right? How important is partnership, brand partnerships uh, for the growth of your company over time in an industry like this? Oh man, I just got goosebumps because I think, honestly, when I started Assault, that was the best thing I loved about this industry that we all really helped each other out. I mean, I have the best, best partners. I made the best friends in this industry and, uh, gotta get choked up. Cause I really, 
I don't think we'd be here if we didn't have the friendships and the partnerships that we have from the very, very start. Um, you know, I mean, everything, I mean, I've worked with every single wheel company, I mean, GBC, uh, you know, a uh, fuel method. I mean, everybody and and it, we, in everybody was, you know, and I loved supporting their cars and stuff. And, um, but going back to the whole partnership with friends and all that, it is, it's huge because, um, you know, we, we're out there at these same events, we're out there riding, uh, we're out the dunes together, the dirt, and it's just that whole, um, and you're right. It's, it's one of those things that I think our industry has the, the greatest people. They all are out there to help. They're all out there to support. Um, and it's been, it's made my, uh, you know, my life just amazing because I've never, uh, I've never been at an event where, you know, I, I felt threatened or, you know, I mean, just like guys like, you know, I, competition. I mean, I'll throw out Axia, Mike from there. I mean, I see him at all these events and I could still have a beer with him, you know, uh, PRP. I mean, we make seatbelt harnesses and they make them and you know what, we can still be out riding on the trip on the trail and, and have, you know, have a good laugh and a talk. Um, so, you know, the crazy thing is, is that when I started assault, it was, you know, we were, we were, it, we were pretty much trying to stay in our own lane and making billet parts and radius rods and, um, the hard part is that the industry kind of, it, it just got big. All of a sudden you got people looking going, oh, well, he's making these. I'm going to make radius rods too. And I'm going to make mirrors. And, you know, when we were a small group, it was great because everybody just focused on one thing. And it is kind of sad because, you know, you get, but business change and, and to stay, you know, to continue to grow a business. And that is the American dream is to continue to grow it and, and get to a point where, um it's you know it, it becomes your vision um you know we we started getting a lot of competition so that's where we you know as as uh you know as steering the ship and the leader of us all that was like hey we've got to we got to keep keep making more products it, the brand is is a powerful uh, name in the industry and people want you know we make something and people like what else can you make we want the whole car needs to be assault we want you know we want harnesses we want, you know, we want to, uh, you know, mirrors and shifters, anything we've made, people are just like, oh yeah, I need that for my car. It's like this lifestyle that we develop. Um, and, and I got, I'm so proud of it because I love it because people that love assault, they just, they want everything assault. And that's where, you know, it's, it was tough. And I, you know, I stepped, I stayed away from wheels and suspension and, um, just because I had so many friends in the industry that I never wanted to step on their toes. Um, but, you know, and things change, you know, you know, uh, wheel pros, you know, they got ZRP now. So now they're, you know, your ZRP is making suspension and radius rods and, you know, and it, but no hard feelings. It's like, hey, you know what? It's it's business and still love those guys over there. And um, but it's like, hey, you know what? It, that might be a good opportunity now for us to make wheels someday, right. you know? And, and competition's always good, right? Like even if it's your friends, you're still pushing each other to do better, to do come out with new options. I mean, it, it's the common scenario in racing, right? Racing drives innovation because they're they're competing against each other, and most of those racers are buddies because they've had to go through these experiences together, right? And so there's nothing wrong with competition. There's nothing wrong with having another product in the marketplace. Um, you know, you, something interesting I was thinking about the other day um, is the idea of products that do the same thing right and and things that can only be designed fairly similar to each other to accomplish that same goal right how do you guys approach you know creating products that do the same thing that someone else is doing and keeping it unique enough to where you can say you know this is our product i there's a couple things i think all the manufacturing that i've done in the past or that i did in the past for aerospace you know military uh, Yamaha and Honda and Harley Davidson has given me such a wide vision of how to design parts. And I think when you look at an assault part, uh, you see style to it, you see functionality to it. You see, um, you know, the, I mean, everything from just the way we engrave it, or, uh, we finish the product with different colors and all that. It just, I think that's, I think we kind of, uh, brought a whole new look to how part products look 
and how they're designed. So, cause I still, st- I still, even today, I mean, there's, you know, there's a lot of competition coming out and I look at it. I'm like, okay, well, you know what, this is great. Not, you know, but it doesn't look like assault, you know, I mean, there's always going to be the copycats that, you know, that look <laughs> really similar to you. And you're like, all right, hey, it kind of feels good. Cause like, well, they must love our product. And, you know, uh, so it doesn't, you know, it bothers well, me. Like a, like a radius rod is going to look like a radius, right? Like the only way you can really make a radius rod look different is to put a lot of design into it. Right. Or a lot of extra milling, uh, if you're doing like a, a solid aluminum bar or something, but, uh, you even got other products. Like I, I, I was looking at the, um, uh, switch pro steering wheel mount. It was like, yeah, why didn't that exist like a year ago? That was awesome. Like, you know, those types of things pop up, uh, that are unique and new, but there's a lot of these things that are just, you know, it comes down to implementation and or component like the rod end component selection. Like, um, you know, a lot of guys source them and then where are they sourcing them from? Are they making them themselves or are they buying a high quality product? Like, you know, there's a lot more that goes into just the fact that it exists. Yeah. Well, the funny thing is, I mean, going right back to the radius rods, I mean, we were, you know, we made round barrel race radius rods in the beginning. And then everybody start making round radius rods. So we, I'm like, okay, well, let's step it up. And we designed the, the turret. We call it the turret. Um, it's a hex and we put some milling and put some pockets and just made it look really aggressive and, um, and still looks badass. And it works, uh, you know, better than stock. So, you know, so we did that, but, you know, so now <laughs> there's a lot of hex material out there again. And, you know, we're always trying to figure out, you know, then we came out with the, the first high clearance. We're like, Hey, we're going to make this high clearance out of billet. And uh, you know, so we're always trying to step it up and stay ahead of the competition. Um, eventually everybody gets there and, and, but it makes us be more, uh, more aggressive and, and get more uh, products out and keep innovating and, and making a better product. So I don't know exactly when it happened, but within the last, I don't know, couple, few years, whatever it was, there was this like, this like consistent wave of assault products, right? Like that, that were either being introduced or, or improved upon. And then all of a sudden out of nowhere, there was just like this sharp increase in, in variety. And, uh, I'm pretty sure, you know what I'm talking about. Like there was this, this, this inflection point where it went from this handful of things to being like a ton of things. And I'm sure your SKUs are probably well over a hundred now of what you're making, uh, under the assault brand. Was there something that happened there or was strategic shift or like, how did that happen? Yeah, no, I decided to, uh, risk a little bit more and, and get, a, um, uh, you know, get more employees. Um, and really just, you know, put the throttle down. Um, you know, I really pushed my engineers, um, to, uh, design as many parts as we could. Um, I partnered with a lot of companies to try to figure out ways to incorporate their products with, you know, like the switch pros, um, buggy whips, um, you know, and just really start looking at every product that we could design and engineer, um, and help build assault. So, um, uh, you know, it was, we were, uh, I was on a mission to just continue to get this brand to where, you know, I, since the day one, I started, I always looked at these companies like Oakley, you know, and Fox and, um, you know, these big, huge companies going, I just, it, uh, it baffled me how big they got and, you know, the, how, how the, the brand is known around the world. And that's where I really, really want to see assault one day. And um, it just gets ca- scary because, you know, to get to where I am now was a big risk and and it was really, really hard. I mean, it, these last two years, I mean, I went to so many different events. I've been, you know, I work Monday through Sunday. I'm constantly on Instagram looking at competition and, and seeing, you know, where do I need to step it up? Um, looking at, you know, new machines working with. So it got to a point where it was, uh, it's been really, really hard, but it's been super exciting and, uh, and super fun to see where, you know, where the brand is. And that's Um, one thing that I can say is, is a lot of times people think they get to a certain level and they just have people that go to shows or whatever. And I don't think I've ever seen a show where assault was that you weren't there or, you weren't able to, so you had somebody that like filled in for you. But for the most part, I've always seen you there smiling, hobnobbing, doing the talk, doing the show and and having a good time. And I think that's really unique about our industry is just that, you know, off-road's been around forever, right? And and there's no shortage of off-road shows. 
But the UTV scene really, I mean, even Sandsport's evidence of that, right? Like Sandsport is now a UTV show. Um, and, and I think people continue to gravitate to it just because of that camaraderie and that ability to connect with people, even at the top level of business, right? Like that they're there to, to, to be connected, to be part of that community. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I have been, I mean, <laughs> I'm probably at 95% of all of the events. Um, you know, it, we've been trying to, well, last year we did, we actually moved from the West coast. We try to do some mudding events. So, uh, Rednecks with Paychecks was one of them, uh, Mud Nationals. Unfortunately, I couldn't make it. I literally just got a uh, hernia operated on and fixed. And yeah, they're like, yeah, you can't get on a plane right after this. And so we had to, uh, I had a bypass on that one, but looking forward to it this year. Um, but it is, these, these events, when you get to sit there and talk to the customer and that customer comes up and goes, you know what? I've got these assault radius rods or I got this assault mirrors. You guys make the best product. Um, never had an issue with it. And they, you know, hey, I called your customer service and, you know, um, we had we had an issue. We had to take care of it. We took care of them. And, and when customers come, and come to our come to me, God, sorry, um, and tell me this, all these stories, it just makes me want to work that much harder. I mean, it's just the best, best thing that I could ever have done was sit there and listen to that consumer, you know, the end user, the, um, the guys out there that are actually using our products. And I get to hear what, what they like and what they need and what they would change. And I mean, if they're, if someone gives me an idea and they're like, Hey, you should do it this way. It's like, we go back and we do, we, we've made, you know, our, our spare tire rack has probably had three revisions already. <laughs> you know, someone's like, Oh, we should, we should put a plate on it. That way if there's no spare tire. I'm like, Oh, okay. So, you know, it used to be just bars and now there's a plate on there and people sometimes put their roto, roto, rack, uh, roto packs on there. Sometimes they put a pro Eagle Jack on it, um, you know, but it's going to these events and listening to the people, what they want um, and then going out and having fun. So, so it makes me want to keep working harder. You, so if you are, if you ever go like Facebook creep Marcelo's page or do anything like that, you know, he's, he's a big family guy and he's got a lot of, uh, mm -hmm personal time spent with them how important has it been to step away from business and focus on family while trying to also work seven days a week to build this brand to where it's been oh man that's look at my wife she loves to travel and i am so grateful for her because she's always like hey we're gonna take two weeks we're gonna go to italy and we're gonna have this amazing trip and and I'm always like, does she, does uh, she tell you when the vacations are? <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I'm always like, no, honey, I'm not, we can't, I can't take two weeks off or, you know, sometimes you're 15, you know, 16 days. And I'm like, are you crazy? I'm like, there's no way. So, you know, eventually I got to go. Right. And the kids got to go. And, um, but it ends up being such a savior. And I'll tell you right now with this whole COVID thing and not be able to go on vacation, it's, it really has put a toll on me because you really need that family time. And, you know, being able to travel with my kids and show them the world. I mean, we've been all over and they've been all over, which is great. Um, but it is, it ends up really, I always hate it. Cause I'm like, I can't do it, honey. But when I'm on vacation, I never want to come back. I'm <laughs> like, Oh my God, you know, uh, having, you know, just being in Tuscany or, you know, being in Costa Rica, surfing with my kids and, um, and just experiencing just different cultures and different countries. It's the best thing. And it just gives you so much energy because it makes you want to work that much harder. So you can do again, you do another trip the next, you know, the following year. Um, so yeah, I know it's super, super, super important. And I mean, I couldn't thank my, my wife enough to keep pushing me to keep traveling and, and taking that time off to, uh, relax and really enjoy life. Cause, um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're not getting any younger and, uh, you know, there's still so many other places that we haven't been to that, uh, that we want to experience. So definitely want to keep traveling. Speaking of COVID, um, uh, I was, and I was going to ask you about your employees. Like you, you mentioned that you guys started kind of like as a three guy group and, and work towards building this, this thing up. And eventually you have to start hiring people. You have to start growing the, the personnel. Where are you guys at today? And then how has COVID impacted you guys over the last couple of years? Yeah. COVID, this was crazy because COVID, I mean, obviously we, everybody just, I mean, I was scared. We were, everybody uh, here was scared. 
And I really, I mean, I've never been so stressed out. And it was probably one of the scariest days of my life. I thought I was going to lose everything, you know, with everybody shutting down, every, everybody needs to go home. We can't work. And I said, okay, well, this is it. Everything I worked hard for is uh, literally going to be taken away from me. Um, but as new rules came out and they're like, hey, you know, anybody in the medical industry or transportation could keep their doors open. So I got super, super lucky because Innovative Metals, my machine shop and IMD Fab, uh, both did medical work. We did a lot for the transportation. We did aerospace. We do stuff for trains, automobile, VNM and racing. Um, so we stayed open. And then Assault, since we're all under, all under one roof, we were able to stay open. But it was sad because, you know, I sent everybody home because right when it happened, I said, okay, I got to start figuring out, I got to reduce costs, right? I got to keep the pay for the pay for the, uh, the rent. I got to make sure I pay for insurance, blah, 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 all that. So I literally had to lay everybody off for, you know, I basically said, Hey, I, until we could figure this out, I got to lay you guys off. So it was the hardest day in my life because everybody in assault is a family. I mean, I've got the best team ever. Um, so me and my wife were coming to work by ourselves, literally to assault. And, uh, she was helping me pull, pull all the orders. We're, you know, doing all the invoices and it was crazy because it never stopped all of a sudden. I mean, people are staying home and just on their computers. Oh, I need this. I need that. And it just, it for two weeks and it wasn't, I mean, it might've been just one week. I think I start calling everybody back. Like after that first week, I said, Hey guys, <laughs> look at, we got orders still coming in. I'm going to keep you guys at home. Cause you know, this whole COVID thing was a big scare and we're all, you know, scared less like we're going to die. Um, so, you know, I said, Hey, why don't, why don't, uh, you know, if you could work from home and you could do the marketing Rolando from home. Um, I brought my shipping guys and we all just separated and just little by little, um, brought everyone back. And you know what? We worked through COVID. Um, you know, we all had gloves on and masks. <laughs> I mean, it was kind of, you know, it was the unknown. So it was, uh, it was a little bit scary, but we had the team and the team was willing. They're like, no, we want to come back. We want to work. We're not, you know, let's, let's do this. And oh my God, I, again, I get choked up because my team from day one has been just the most awesome group of guys and girls that um, anyone could ask for. And, uh, and yeah, we survived COVID and we actually did better than ever. And um, it's been fun. It's been challenging, but uh it's been a, a lot, a lot of fun. So the brand has gotten to this point. Are you at a point where you feel like you've achieved the goals you had envisioned for the brand and where you wanted to go? Or are there some, some fruit that you still feel like there's, there's things to go get plucked off the tree and, and things you want to accomplish? So, yeah, no, I think... And this is a lead up into the next thing, which you, you know I'm bringing up, but, but yeah. I just wanted to kind of bring that first. No, this is, this is tough for me because... You know, this has been my baby. I mean, I I I live it. Um, I think about it every day. I and you know, like I said before, I want this brand to be, you know, the next Oakley, the next I don't know, Quicksilver. Um, I I think there's a lot that this brand can still grow into, um, and you know different industries. Um, it, it, it's just, I love the name. People love the name, uh, the logo and everything about it, the lifestyle. Um, the problem is for me, it's, I, it's not there yet. I mean, we're, it's still, it's a, it's a teenager right now. It's not that adult yet. Um, but it's hard because, you know, I'm not getting any younger, you know, we're only a, a team of, uh, got a team of eight here. I think we got eight total employees. So we're a small team. Um, but to get, get to that whole next level, I mean, you need hundreds and hundreds of employees. You need a bigger building. Um, there's so much more risk. Um, but it, it, yeah, it, and I think it's one of those things that I've been doing this for a long, long time. And, uh, and, uh, uh those beaches are I, looking real good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, they, they are. I think uh, I'd like to take four weeks vacation, at, you know, <laughs> in either, uh, you know, let's say Costa Rica or maybe in France or something. But um, 
I, I, and I couldn't do it for more than that because my brain is always thinking. I mean, my brain is always th- trying to figure out, you know, the, the next best thing, you know, what else can we design? What can we just engineer? Um, I got way, way too much energy to sit <laughs> on the beach for the rest of my life. But, um, but no, I think, uh, you know, I think the assault has a long way to go. I think, you know, I, I, to where I want it to be, it's not going to happen next year. It's not going to happen two or three years. It's going to take, you know, five, you know, at least a good five years, maybe, maybe even more. Um, and, you know, not having that whole background of business and all that. I mean, I, I think what I'm really, really good at is, you know, thinking of a product, branding, marketing, um, but the whole business side of it is, is really, really hard. And you really need a really good team that, that understands um, how to, how to get to that next level. Yeah. We talked about, you know, CNC days, right? Like that was a huge investment, a huge step forward. And to get to that next level that when you're at a certain level of business, the the next step is a, a pretty substantial increase in, in development costs in investment in, in business and logistics in employees and, uh, fulfillment and, and all these different things. Right. And, um, you know, at some point within the last, I don't know how long it's been six months or whatever, there was a point in time where somebody came to you, uh, kind of tell us that story. We all kind of saw in the news up, we posted it, you know, super ATV has acquired assault industries. What, how did that happen? What does it mean to you? And where do you see the future of the brand working with a, a parent company to further this, further, further the development of this brand? Oh, well, all right. <laughs> it's, it's an awesome story. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's really hard because, well, let me tell you how it happened first. Um, you know, uh, we've been really blessed to have opportunities in, in the past year or so. Um, and one of these opportunities was, uh, super reaching out to me and saying, Hey, you know, would you ever think about, you know, uh, selling your company? And at the time I was like, you know what, obviously everything always has a price. Right. Um, but I wasn't really ready. I, I wasn't really ready to let the, let it go yet. Um, but Lindsay, uh, Hunt, the, uh, one of the owners of, uh, super ATV said, Hey, why don't you come out, meet the team, see what we're all about. Um, and you know, see if this, if this is something you'd like. And, um, from the very beginning, I was like, God, super ATV. I mean, I know them. I, you know, I just, they're a great company and they've been around forever. I mean, I remember seeing them on eBay, uh, for, you know, quads and stuff. And, you know, it was just an East coast brand. So I just couldn't relate to them, uh, uh, that much, but, uh, they invited us out there and, uh, they're actually out of Madison, Indiana. And so my wife and I go, Hey, you know what? We love to travel. We haven't been out traveled in a while. We're like, let's go to Tennessee and we'll go check out Jack Daniels and we'll go to Nashville. And so we did a little bourbon tour. And then we ended up at, uh, in Madison with, uh, with Indy, uh, with super ATV and got to see, uh, meet Harold, which is a founder of super ATV, his daughter, uh, Damon, um, and their, their entire team, they took us for a tour. And I was like, I was blown, blown away. I was like, first of all, just all the employees, the the family, they started the business Super ATV. They almost started just like us, you know, kind of like in the garage of their of their home, and they and and the family brought it up and and you know started to grow it, and they grew it to this monster that it is today. And a lot of people don't know any much about Super ATV, especially here on the West Coast. I was, let me backtrack most people on the west coast don't know uh, much about super atv but what i learned was that their manufacturing is pretty much the same as ours if but a lot it, you know on steroids or they've got a great great um shop there um they've got you know they they've got uh they got into making windshields um, they've got, you know, probably 20 engineers, they got quality guys, they've got, I mean, they've got someone for everything. And obviously, um, you know, I think they've got over 400 employees and I was blown away. And I just, me and I talked to Christine, I go, look, they're going to be able to get assault to, um, God, sorry, dude, I get choked up here. Um, 
you know, they are going to be able to grow a salt and get it to where I've always wanted it to be. You know, it kind of hurts to let go of the reins. And, um, but yeah, it's going to be a badass next, you know, it's going to be a great adventure with these guys. Um, you know, it's only, it's, it's so it happened. Uh, yeah, it's been, it's been in the works um, for about six months, really just trying to finalize everything and make sure everything was right. And, you know, I wanted to make sure I was, you know, letting go of the reins to the right people and, and that I trust. And, you know, I didn't want to go with a company that was going to look at us and just turn and kind of turn and burn us. You know, I didn't want to do an M&A type of deal. Um, so um, with that being said, I just said, yeah, Christina, and I, it's, let's take some chips off the table and let's see where these guys could uh, could take us all to. And 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 we're super excited. I mean, it's it's going to be hard because, you know, I'm hoping that our team sticks together, the assault team. And it's it's going to be a fun adventure. Just, you know, having more more uh, God, more employees that not employees. It just it's going to be a lot better having uh, so many assets at my fingertips. So that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've been through acquisitions like that where. You know, I'm a piece of that puzzle that is something that they wanted to acquire, right? And and there's a lot that goes into the transition of that, especially when you're talking about manufacturing, right? And uh, the people, the core team is involved with the, the dirty day-to-day outside in the warehouse type stuff. And it's super important as a leader, I'm, assume, I'm assuming you're right on track with this, is that... You, now your your perspective becomes more on how am I taking care of them? How am I doing justice to them on this thing that they've helped me build? You know, they've put their time and their effort. It's not just a paycheck for a lot of these guys, right? And um, you want to honor that and you want to make sure that you take care of those people. Um, you know, how does that look for you and and the company? Like, I, I obviously, there's going to be um, efficiencies involved with bringing some of that in-house, some of it there where you're at, and, and there will be some fluctuations and stuff, but how does an, as a business founder and owner, how does that impact you and, and now your perspective on how you handle this? Yeah, well, it's, man, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I've been struggling for, uh, since it's happened. Um, you know, you think I'd be super, uh, pumped. I am. I'm super, I'm happy. I'm like, I'm really, really happy, but I think Deep inside, um, you know, my employees have been, I mean, they're like family. They are. I mean, it, I know people always use that terminology, but I see these guys more than I see my family. I see them eight hours straight a day. I work with them. We design, we engineer, we produce. I mean, we we go through so many things together um, and for so many, you know, uh, hours and, and, and days. Um, so, it was and it is still very very hard and um at the end of the day you know i'm doing everything i can to keep them with the assault brand and in the company and and you know and and super has been a great great company as well and they're giving them opportunities and you know so i'm hoping everything at the end of the day aligns and works out um because you're right it's it's you know the brand was built by the employees as well. Um, the brand was, you know, everything that you see about assault. Um, you know, I can't take, you know, it, it starts in my head and I use them to help me get to where, and they've got great ideas too. So don't get me wrong. It's not like it's just me doing everything, but it is, it's, it's come from everybody, from every, every one of my employees, um, and even friends that, you know, that, you know, I get ideas and we just go for it. And, um, it'd be really, really nice that, uh, you know, it, they, they're, they're still part of the assault team and, and we continue to grow it. So looking at the future, now that you're, you're looking at a position of, uh, almost co-brand development, right? You're talking about now integrating with people that you haven't worked with before. You're talking about people that know a lot of things that you don't know. There's things that you've experienced that they don't know. You, you have this new collaboration, right? Um, how do you see what, what's the future look like for you without telling us like, the secret sauce, right? Like you can't tell us everything, but you know, how does the future look for the brand? How do you next year, the year after that, how do you see the brand progressing in, in this vision that you have? Well, this is exciting because I mean, I think this is one of the reasons I did this is that again, Lindsay is an awesome, awesome person and she's got a great vision. Um, and 
Super ATV, they've got a, a really, really strong team. Um, and I think this is where it's just going to accelerate um, the assault brand. I think now, um, you know, what, what kept me from getting to that next level was having, you know, 10, 20, 30 engineers to keep, to get every product that's in my head out um, or every idea. So, you know, marketing, we've got, you know, we're going to have a lot more guys help us with the marketing. Um, you know, it's just having that big support group behind us is, and, and manufacturing. The good thing is that, you know, we're going to continue to manufacture parts here. Um, Super is going to be able to take a lot of that stuff on into their Indiana plant and help us produce more. I mean, they've got lasers and two benders. They basically have the same equipment we have, but probably twice as much. Um, and uh, so it should be easier to get more products out quicker. Um, and and just, uh, just having that team um, is going to be uh, accelerating, hopefully, the growth of Assault. Does that make sense? Yeah, there's definitely uh, a, a logistics part of it that becomes strengthened. And, and in some areas, it doesn't get any faster, but it just gets stronger, right? Like the ability to just say, oh, I'm not going to waste time figuring this out. There's going to be someone that knows it, right? Like you can just hand that <clears throat> off. They can move it and then it happens. It's just you're not going through the speed bumps along the way. Um, and then there's going to be some other growth issues where things get you know slowed down because now you got all this new system process that you have to go through. But the nice thing that that I've learned through our conversation, right? Like going through ISO process, going through, you know, industry standards, standardization and things like that uh, kind of puts you in a place of plug and play, right? Like if you're already at this level, you can then bring your brand up to where where you need to be. And uh, it kind of just is a migration versus an adaptation. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. That's exactly um, why I think this this new um, adventure in my life is going to be super, super exciting because everybody that I've met so far from Super ATV, their team is, I mean, they are on it. They're amazing. Um, they, 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 they have the energy that I have and it's going to make this whole new transition, um, really adventurous and fun to, uh, see where, where this, uh, the assault name goes. And, um, it's going to be a lot, a lot of fun. Um, to kind of change course a little bit, um, some, somewhere where I've seen a lot of growth is in the sponsorship and off-road scene, right? Like Assault has been around for a while now and, and but then they've been in the development of the UTV racing scene, right? So it's natural that the organic growth in that scene has, has taken off. Um, you know, we've, we've had Adrian from Rancho on, we've had a various number of people, uh, Blake Wilkie and, and all these different people that are involved with the off-road scene and the racing scene, um, on the show. And I think it's important to understand that, um, not only is a brand going to grow because of good products, they're going to grow because their involvement with the industry, right? Like you're actually a part in sponsoring the growth of an industry, right? And, um, how has the racing scene benefited you and how, has your involvement with that scene grown over time? And how does that, and then to take it one step further, how does that look going forward with this new integration where you have, you know, a, a partner that no longer, that wasn't really part of the off-road desert racing scene and all that stuff, but now being cohorts with you are natively integrated into that. How does that look? So the kind of that, that transition and all that. So, yeah, no, I, the, 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 the relationships and partnerships I've had, with um so many racers um has been you know it, it's really been something that uh helped grow assault i think it's one of those things that once you see an assault product on a race car and they're finishing and or you know even winning races and podium you know races like the baja 500 and the 1000 it just literally makes the brand that much um, it qualifies it basically. It qualifies it. Hey, you know what? You can put an assault part and it finishes these races. It's it's a badass part. It's a strong part. It's not just a beauty part. It's not just something, a cosmetic part. No, we're making parts that, you know, we're putting them to the test. We're making them, you know, uh, get pounded and, and really put through the most vigorous testing really that someone can put these uh, uh, products to. So um, it was really from the very beginning, um, you know, I, and I really never took any marketing classes, but I was always really um, adamant to to really give these racers 
products and have them test it for us and and help grow assault. Um, and we became and lots of great racers and uh, we became uh, great friends like, you know, obviously Rancho, uh, Adrian and the Risk family, Westman. I mean, we have so many really strong, you know, Wilkie. Um, these are big names that trust the salt. I mean, they're, you know, obviously they've got uh, reckon uh, they've got to um, they got to keep the their, their they oh, got to keep their car going. They got to keep their car going, yeah. And uh, and and the last thing they want to do is put something that's going to fail or you know give them a bad taste in people's you know uh, mind that hey why why are they partnering with these people? So seeing our products on Wilkie's car or seeing our products on Risk Racing, West Miller. I mean, I've, uh, speed, you know, Robbie Gordon, uh, we manufactured for him and he's using our products. Um, I mean, you got these big, big names out there, um, that believe in assault, trust the salt. Um, so it's, it, it goes really, really far to have these types of guys and, and keep sponsoring them because you know what, if, if our parts can't be tested or used on race cars, <laughs> then they're they're not strong enough for the average person. So um, I think it's really really important. And I think now that you know Super ATV is behind us, um, you know I don't think anything's going to change. I'm hoping that if anything we we're able to grow the program. And and you know I've always wanted to have. I always wanted to be kind of like a Formula One racer and have our own Assault Team Six. You know, kind of a, a group of guys that could go out there and 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 race for uh, for Assault. Um, you know, maybe there's opportunities. I mean, these are things that always been in my head and, uh, you know, nobody knows about them other than, you know, my internal team here, but, um, uh, I think, uh, there's going to be a lot more opportunities and maybe I'll get out there and race a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to uh, say, are we going to see a Marcelo car? I, yeah, I hope so. I mean, I did Nora, uh, a couple of, right before COVID, uh, that was that Baja 1000 and I loved it. And I, and it's coming back this year. And, um, you know, it's something I have, obviously I've got to talk to, uh, to my boss now. <laughs> how, <laughs> and, how does that feel now having to talk to a boss? <laughs> I never had to, but you know what? I love, love Lindsay. I, they're her family and I feel so comfortable with them. And, um, you know what? It's, I, I'm a really easygoing guy. Um, it's kind of nice. It's, you know what, there's structure in my life and, and, uh, I'm going to work my ass off for them. And, um, yeah, it, it's going to be fun. I, it, yeah, it's, it's hard. It was hard going, you know, like I said, letting go of the reins and, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hopefully still going to be the face of assault and, uh, it's going to be fun. It's going to be good. So, so you've had assault and you've had this metal fab business. Is the metal fab business still gung ho going forward or was that part of the acquisition or like, how does that work? Nope. Nope. The, the, so the, all my manufacturing stays, stays here with me. Um, and well, he's like my partner and, and, uh, he's, uh, my dad, my dad's semi retired. So, um, you know, that's basically his retirement. So I've got to keep that up and running and, um, we're going to keep manufacturing and, you know, keep all, all of our customers. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 I love it because, it's kind of, you know, I, I don't think I'll ever let that go because hopefully I can give that to my kids someday and um, let them take it over. But it's kind of what started everything. It's given me this uh, awesome opportunity um, that, you know, I don't. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's something that like I could never let go. It has too much value, too much family value. And um, so I'm lucky to have it still. Well, I'm super excited. Uh, it's always a good time to talk about a company growing to a point where people want to buy them, right? Like that's always a good conversation to have because some, that means somebody did something right. And it's always something we can learn from, right? Like we can always glean information from a success story, right? And I think it's important to talk about those successes as an industry because so, there's so many of us that in our industry that are starting mom and pop shops that are starting little businesses that want to create stuff and fab stuff. And, um, it's important for us to talk about those things to grow our industry healthy, not just bigger. And, um, you know, it, as we talk about those little businesses that are trying to grow and, and over the years, you've seen your arc of the storyline, right? Um, what are some takeaways that some of these small businesses or maybe even medium sized businesses can take away from the lessons you've learned through this whole process over the last 20 years? You know what? I think it's one of those, one thing that I've always been able to do, and I think it's it's so important for any company, is that you've got to be able to wake up in the morning and look in the mirror 
and say, you know what, I'm doing everything right. I think integrity, uh, something my dad always taught me is that, you know what, if you, if, if, if you're honest and you're a fair person and a nice person, good things will always come, come to you. So I would say, uh, you know what, it's, you're, I'm living an American dream. I mean, this is something that, you know, I wanted to do. I, you know, I'm super happy and um, anybody could do it. I mean, it does, it it just, you gotta, you gotta want to put the hours in, you gotta believe in your product. You gotta be, and again, the integrity is so important. I think that's what uh, um, really helped me excel uh, the brand and, and having the relationships I had because um, yeah, I just, you know, I try to, I try to do everything the right way and, and, and be honest. And, um, yeah, he got me to a really good point in my life and yeah, so super, super excited. Yeah. That's, that's definitely part of our community, our community's, um, ethos, right? Like being straight up and being, you know, flexible and being, you know, if, if you're having to dodge and weave, you know, the integrity game, ultimately speaking, you're just going to end yourself up in a trap, right? Like it's just going to, whether that be, uh, you know, through your conversations with people, whether that be with your consumers being upset with you, whether that be your manufacturing supply chain, all those things come into play with, with, with your morals and your integrity and not looking for every single dollar, not looking for every single cent. Um, you know, we just had, uh, Russell from buggy whips on uh, the show. And one of the key things we talked about was, we're not just building a product to get money from people. We're building something that means something, a product that means safety, something that accomplishes the goal that it was intended to do. And we're going to do it for the highest level possible. We're not going to just upsell you one thing after another. And I think it's super important, not only in our industry's manufacturing side of, of product development, but also just each one of us, as we kind of navigate the waters of our community, that we don't try to just get everything for us that we're not selfish that we have some sort of moral level that we operate at and i think that's what leads to successful business no you're absolutely right that's i mean that's the same way i mean the same way i ran my company i've always always wanted to take care of our customers i mean it doesn't matter what what issues they ever had um we wanted to be the nordstrom's of the off-road you know what I will take care of my customers. I mean, I get on the calls with them when, when, you know, with, if my, uh, you know, if it elevates to the point where my, my, uh, customer service team can't help them, I get on calls and, and I always want to make things right for everybody out there. Um, because at the end of the day, if we don't have any customers, we don't have a business and they, every single one of them, uh, means everything to us. And, uh, um, so that's, it's, yeah, you're, so you hit it right on the, on the spot there. So, uh, where's the next four week vacation going to happen? <laughs> Probably <laughs> not for a long, long time. Unless, yeah, I, you know, <laughs> unless I'm just killing it and, you know, Luke goes, yeah, you know what, why don't you go take a break? <laughs> <laughs> I'd be scared if someone told me to take a break. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Right. So, so I, yeah, I'm re- I'm really really am ready for one. I like I said, we in these last six eight months, about well, no, six months has been really. I mean, it's been challenging, and um, you know, going through this whole process, it was tough. It was tough, and you know, me and my wife uh, Christina have. Uh, I mean, we were waking up at three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning, and you know, looking at each other, going, "Oh my God, what are we doing? Is this right?" But you know what? Uh, yeah, so. Just keep, yeah, just follow me on Facebook. You'll see me when, uh, <laughs> when I'm on vacation. So uh, I would assume that we're going to keep the salt brand around. We're not going to be putting everything over to super. So where can people find the brand? Where can we follow you online? Where can we uh, follow the the navigation of the new waters that you're in and, and the product development and all that stuff? Yeah. So, um, you know, Instagram, the salt IND. Um, we've got Facebook. Um, and then my, uh, you know, my, my social media, I don't even think I even know what it is, but I think it's just IMD Marcelo, but, uh, yeah, if you guys want to follow me, go for it. Uh, I'm not that of an exciting of a guy. <laughs> it basically turns into you wishing you were where, wherever he was. So, um, so follow, uh, Marcelo online, follow assault industries at assault uh, and the social medias. You can find his new partners at superatv.com. 
uh, and their social medias. You can find our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, uh, uh, Spotify, iHeartRadio, all those different places. Uh, you can even watch uh, Marcelo's Beautiful Face on YouTube if you watch the show there. So uh, check us out. Uh, follow us. Give us a like and a share. Uh, if you're on Apple, make sure to give us a five star if we deserve it. And uh, until the next time, guys, peace. Peace.